Great. Welcome, everybody. Am I native of the day? You've already heard all the politicians? Yeah. <laughs> and if you're smart, you'd go home early. <laughs> we're not going to tell you what their answers were either. You have to figure that out. Um, when you walked in, Betsy was just fin finishing up a piece talking about uh, one of our key uh, pieces of our economic growth advocacy this year is evolving our, our brand from a great place to come and play to a great place to come work, <coughs> come live, work, and do business, work and play. And, uh, you know, we're looking at, it's kind of a major change for, for the whole brand of Vermont, and maybe in future years there, it actually could uh, need some funding. So when we look at that kind of concept, it, how do you feel about that? Well, uh, you know, I think you can do a lot more to promote uh, what we've got here. And, you know, I know as, as a business person, uh, I do better when I let people know the product I've got to sell. In the case of Vermont, we couldn't ask for a better product to sell. We've got more going on, more creatively, I think, to, in the travel, tourism, food, farm to plate, uh, you know, what's going on in a, in a bi-local movement than probably any state in the country. So, Phil knows that uh, the board and Betsy and the whole chamber team, we've all had a little talk about this. You know, I'm a little handcuffed uh, today because governors like their budget address to sort of be news. So I guess all I'd say is if you care deeply about this, you show up for the speech tomorrow. If I include it, can't clap. If I don't, boo, and let's see what comes. Uh, that the reality of what's happening, not only in Vermont, but across America, is hitting them in the pocketbooks. And what is it? Greatest wage gap since before the Great Recession. The folks who were doing very well in the recession are doing even better now. Unfortunately, it's only about one or 2% of Americans. Middle class Vermonters are playing by the rules, working hard, doing everything that's expected of them, and finding that the bills are coming in faster than they can pay. Lower income Vermonters are worse off than they were in the bottom, the depths of the recession, worse off. So that's our challenge together. How do we make the state more affordable? How do we grow jobs, economic opportunity? How do we lift incomes? That's what it's about. So. I feel like the legislature and myself have never been asked to address more issues in one biennium, because we all know that there are a lot of factors that are holding back affordability in a state. Well, what are they? First is job growth. We're growing jobs, but we still don't have enough people trained to do the jobs that we have. And if you talk to employers, you hear this, I don't need to tell you all, because many of you in this boat, uh, you know, I can't tell you how often employers say to me, Governor, I had one say to me recently, if you could give me 90 people that are good at computer programming, I could give them $90,000 a year with benefits. That's just one company. And I can give you that example time and time again. So I laid out my speech in two parts. I took on first what I think is a huge opportunity for job growth and innovation. It's different than what's happening anywhere else in the country. I likened it to what Phil brought up earlier, which is you know, the folks that 40, 50, 60 years ago were cutting trails with chainsaws into the Green Mountains to create ski slopes. I say that what we could do with energy innovation and what we're doing, but what we can really put it on steroids, will be as big as what we now do with skiing, tourism, travel. In other words, it will augment that sector of the economy. Why do I say that? Because we're the only state in America right now, and I hear this from other governors that say, really? Like your utilities are behind this? Our major utility, 80% utility, and many of the others have changed their business model. They're now saying, instead of the business model being, let's find big generation out there somewhere, pipe as much of it into a Vermont through poles and wires as we possibly can, and sell as much of it as we possibly can, they're saying, hey, there's something new that's gonna give us prosperity. Let's instead, be the entity that goes out with all lots of other job creators and a lot of other partners, including state government, and says what we did to that house over in Rutland, we're about to do 100 more. You take an older home, the family the company comes in, they flip out your doors, they replace your windows, they insulate the heck out of it. They throw solar panels on the roof, they throw a heat pump in the basement, they got storage capacity somewhere, and all of a sudden, they have zero oil costs, they have their electric cost cut in a half or a third, and they have a much more comfortable home heating and cooled in the summertime, all locally right on that project, and guess what? You don't have to be rich to do it, because the utility 
charges all of it to your bill and bills it back to you over a period of time. And that's a pretty, pretty amazing thing. Now, if you did that, instead of to 100 homes in Vermont, to a third of our homes, it's a huge jobs creator. And it's good for not only the environment, future generations, climate footprint, and don't forget, it won't be long before you're also plugging your car into that system, all being locally generated. So I predict, and remember I said this in 20, 30 years, that we'll be fighting, you know, we all have that big fight over whether we should sign that Hydro-Quebec contract that Governor Snelling signed or not, and you know, sometimes it looked really good, and other times it looked so bad we were trying to sue him for ice and all that stuff. In the end, we wished we'd get the contract back when it expired. I predict that we'll be fighting as intensely over who's going to pay for all the poles and wires that we ran all over the place in 20 or 30 years as we were during the snelling years and long after he was governor whether or not that contract was a wise thing now that's just a prediction lake you can't grow jobs economic opportunity in a state without our natural resources we got new york over there offering all kinds of incentives billions of dollars to try you know bribe you to go and live in new york state and it would take a lot of money to get any of us to go over there and live there but anyway the one thing we have that you can't replace is our quality of life our natural resources our mountains our lakes our streams the fact that you know when joe gets done working he often hits the ski slopes or goes hiking or paddling you know that, that's why we live here that's what draws many here. That's why some of us like me stay here. You can't replace that. We had last summer so much blue green algae on our lakes that not only could you not swim in them without getting sick, but you had to drive away from them because it stunk so bad. This isn't okay. So huge economic driver. I laid out a course to the most aggressive <coughs> cleanup of our waters that I believe any governor has laid out. This, there's sacrifice from everybody. We all got to chip in, but we got to get that one right to grow our economy and grow prosperity and keep our quality of life in Vermont. <clears throat> then the others that I'll lay out going forward, I'll talk more about when Phil asks me. I miss those talking points. All right, um, <laughs> that was, we wanted something a little, little, little tougher. Um, you mentioned tomorrow you're going to give your budget address and with details on your plan to address, I guess the, it's the $94 million question now. It hasn't changed. No, good. Not, not today. No. Um, for, for fiscal year 16. Uh, can we anticipate that, will there be any raising or introducing of new taxes be included as a way to address the gap along with cuts? Uh, you know, I'm gonna be a little, <clears throat> a little careful not to give my budget address here at the Capitol Plaza, but having said that, uh, you know how I feel about taxes. Uh, I feel strongly that, and I'm proud of the fact that I've now managed four consecutive budgets without raising rates on income taxes, sales taxes, and rooms and meals taxes. I don't do that because I'm you know, a right-wing a right -wing Tea Party uh, candidate for governor. I do it because I really believe that those tax rates are high enough and that they're higher than uh, if we want to advance prosperity, we're not going to do it by making ourselves uncompetitive on tax front. So I'm going to try, this will be a balanced budget. The challenge this time is different than my last four in that we, you know, I always say economists, I hope there aren't any here, or if they are, the plug the ears, but economists are great, telling you, are great at telling you what happened. They're less good at telling you about what's going to happen. And they told us, not just me, but Governor Hastings, dealing with this in New Hampshire and all the Northeast governors, that coming out of the recession, we'd see a 5% growth rate, which is traditional for good recoveries. Now they suddenly tell us last year, or I should say about six months ago, wrong, we've been wrong, you're gonna have a 3% growth rate, and that's true for Vermont and for New England and Northeast for the next five, six, seven, eight years. So we've gotta match a 5% spending rate with a 3% growth rate. And what I try to explain to those who believe that we should do it with revenue, I try to explain simple math. If you did it all with revenue, let's say magically, Vermonters could find $100 million in their pockets that they really want to part with. And if anyone has that view, I think they didn't listen to the voters in this last election. Let's just assume for a minute you've been living in a cave somewhere. You'd have to come back next year and raise more taxes again, as long as you're spending at 5% and your growth rate's at 3%. 
so to do it all with taxes doesn't work you've got to make really really tough choices and we're trying to make those wisely we're trying to make them responsibly and this is the truth there will be something to hate about every cut I propose there will and all I'm asking of all of us is recognizing that if we're not fiscally responsible in our state that's our first responsibility we can't grow jobs we can't grow economic opportunity if you don't like the cuts that I've made or the suggestions for restructuring that I'm going to make and you won't like them all I ask you to match your suggestion with a new suggest my suggestion with a new suggestion yours that makes an equal ongoing cut in state spending that's the rule that's what i'm asking folks to do together if that can be the spirit of the conversation we'll make great progress if we're just going to have folks run and say it's terrible how can you cut this how can you do that how can you restructure that it's going to be a long road thank you governor that was that was fair i won't press you on your to reveal your plan ahead of time. I'm gonna try it a little. You did, you're doing a good job. <laughs> um, Speaker Smith, he's, he's, he discussed the increasing <laughs> Medicaid payments to healthcare providers. Uh, with the announcement in December about the uh, single health, single payer healthcare off, being off the table for now, what's next? Are we looking at introducing a new tax to eliminate the Medicaid cost shift? So, just to finish, I mean, I think that Phil's led me into the second part of part two, which is all on prosperity, all what's holding back our incomes. And you all know what they are. It's healthcare costs going up faster than we can get the money in our pockets to pay for them. It's property taxes, school spending, going up at a rate faster than we can pay for them. And those are the two main cost drivers that, that Vermonters have said if you don't change the way we're doing business in these areas, uh, we're not going to achieve prosperity. So you will hear very specific proposals from me on both tomorrow, as well as other areas where we can really make a difference. Thanks. And I, it's a question I, I actually received from one of our members before the event started, and I just asked Lieutenant Governor, and I'll ask you the same one. Is we talk about one way to improve our overall economy is to have businesses doing well and people doing well working at those businesses. That can eliminate a lot of our problems because they'll make more income and then through just general revenues that, that could float all, float all the boats. I have a specific uh, position in, in, in my company where I oversee Vermont and up, upstate New York, over north, with all the nanotech. And I, I see the crazy money, you mentioned it earlier, the yeah. crazy money that the state is spending. And I, I, I don't suggest that. I'm, I just acknowledge the fact that, that, that that's happened there. But the question is, what can we do to, to keep our businesses in Vermont, especially our larger businesses, from leaving? And what can we do to attract other businesses to Vermont, understanding that there, there are expense issues with that? So uh, I, I sometimes think we ask that question without giving ourselves a little credit for the progress we're making. I mean, let's not forget that in all of this conversation, uh, Vermont's on the comeback right now. It's slower than we thought it would be. But you know, when I took over, we were taking in $244 million less in revenue, which Bill just points out is driven by job creators, than we are today, 244 million. We had a much higher unemployment rate we right now have one of the lowest in the country. Bankruptcies in Vermont have plummeted. It's the only way to describe it. Businesses are growing. So what can we really do to help foster that progress? And I say that there are a few things. The first is, as long as you are spending more money than you can make on schools and your qualities not going up, going down while you do it, you gotta fix that. Because people who wanna build businesses, employers, first thing they ask when I hire is, how are your schools for my kids? And are they sustainable? We gotta get that right. Second, if we can be the first state that actually provides better quality healthcare for less cost, that's a huge win for business. So I assume Algo Bay was down here earlier Al and I are two peas in a pod on this one, but 
forget health care financing for a minute, how we raise the money. I recognize we're not going to change that as quickly as I wanted. But that doesn't mean we don't push ahead on all fronts to stop spending money faster than we can earn it. Move from a fee-for-service system to one that rewards outcomes and make sure that we take care of, as, as Bill just said, the Medicaid shift, which is killing business. I mean, you might ask yourselves, why are your insur insurance premiums, healthcare insurance premiums going up 10, 12, I know my state uh, bill this year, up 18% at a time when for the last two years, we've held healthcare spending in this state at the lowest level in over 20 years, two years in a row, 20 years. How come your insurance premiums keep going up when spending is almost flat? The answer, as we move more and more people onto Medicaid, we just cut our uninsured rate in half because of the Affordable Care Act, Vermont Health Connect, cut it in half from over 40,000 folks to 20,000. I suspect the number is actually probably lower than that. What we do is we exasperate your premiums going up because when we shine more people up for Medicaid, more of our providers are getting paid 40 to 60 cents on a dollar for a dollar's work, and someone's got to pay that bill. And guess who does? You. That's why your premiums go up 18 or 20 or 15 percent, while our healthcare spending is close to flat. So that's a place where if we get it right, other businesses will go, well, New York, not so much. They're still doing fee for service. They still got a crazy Medicaid repayment system. We actually know that in Vermont, our healthcare spending going forward is going to be reasonable and sustainable. Third, there are things that we can do with our incentives that will, with Betsy and the other good incentives we have, that'll make them even better. I'll make some proposals about that tomorrow. But they're working for us. We just got to keep them going. And uh, finally, I mean, I already mentioned quality of life, uh, but I really do believe that education is the key. And with all the money that we're spending, we haven't moved the needle one bit. Just get this, one that we have highest per pupil spending in the country, number one per pupil spending in the country. We have not moved the needle one iota in moving first generation kids beyond high school. I can tell you that the employers that I talk to that are looking for employees are usually not saying to me, I need 90 people with a high school degree. It's just not what they're saying. Now they're not necessarily saying I need a college degree either, but you better have some training beyond high school in this workforce where you're sentencing yourself to a low wage job. So we're gonna be talking tomorrow about job training, about all kinds of partnerships we can do with business to help them get the employees that they need right in their workspace. So, you know, our future's bright, cheer up. I personally think those of you here from Chittenden County that uh, our partnership with Global Foundries is just a huge positive for Vermont. I mean, you know, every governor uh, in the last eight to 10, 20 years has feared that as IBM has moved out of chip making into the service business, that they're gonna pick up the paper one day and see, hey, state's largest employer pulling out done with the chip making business. Let's be honest about this. None of us wanted to say it, but I can tell you, there's not, I can assure you that Governor Douglas and Governor Dean are worried about this, and I wouldn't be surprised if Governor Cunin and Governor Snelling at times did too. Well, guess what? We have now entered into a partnership and a great relationship with a company that wants to be number one in the world in chip making. The press was all over them when they bought the plant or trying to buy the plant. They still got to close the deal, but trying to buy the plant. They said, are you going to offer, how many of the people are you going to let go? And how, what are you going to pay? What's your package going to look like? The press being the press, you know, surely think, you know, there's no press here, but surely think it's just going to be terrible. Though. Everything's terrible, right? Change is terrible. Turns out, Global Foundries has offered every single employee there, every single one, that's not remaining with IBM, because they're keeping a couple hundred IBM workers there forever, or for the foreseeable future. Every single one of them, a package. We don't know what the package is, but this I can tell you. In the human re uh, resources meeting where the employees heard about the package, GF got a standing ovation. Here's the better news. 
Global Foundries wants to take the chips that are in almost every phone in the world and make Essex the producer of the lion's share of the market of those chips. They're asking, how can we take the facility, invest in it, so that we can expand jobs, expand opportunity, and expand our business? So all I'm saying is, we got a lot of good stuff going for us, from our biggest private employer making a transfer that could have been a disaster for Vermont into, I think, what is the best possible outcome, probably a better outcome than being partnered, you know, Dress isn't here, so I just say this, but you know, IBM was great to us. But we're now partnering with a company that wants to make chips. That's a pretty good idea when you're in the chip making business. We didn't have that before, and we had it for a while. So from big to small, I say cheer up. You know, Phil Phil said just a second ago, what are you gonna do to promote tourism? Travel, people coming to Vermont. Look at what we're doing in the ag sector and the food sector of Vermont. Forget tourism for a second. That's an incredible story, too. I mean, every one of our mountains, practically, is investing hundreds of millions of dollars, water parks, skiing, four-season resorts, new restaurants, new motels, new hotels, new lifts, stuff I never thought we would have seen. We're going to be, we are number one in the Northeast in skiing, and we're going to stay that way. I should say in four-season resorts, and we're going to stay that way. But, but just get this. If I said to you 10 years ago, you know, the governor in 2014 is going to get to take the World Cheese Award, the World Cheese Awards, and take it from a little farm up in the Northeast Kingdom, Jasper Hill, to a little farm down in Windsor County, because Vermont for two years in a row is going to win the World Cheese Awards. I mean, the best cheese in the world. You would say, come on, you're kidding me. What if I'd said, when you go to, you know, beerbuzz.com or whatever it is, and you know, they rate all the beer in the world, and you're gonna find that you've got all of the world's best beer, number one, number two, and number three, being made in the Green Mountain State. I mean, you know, I'm a deer hunter. I know Democrats aren't supposed to hunt deer, but I love on deer season. It's the only day I like getting up out of the bed when it's still dark, you know? And you go out there and you sit under a tree and you stay till it gets dark again. And it's just a really invigorating thing to do. These folks, I just want to tell you, this, this is true. We got folks in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Michigan. They get up really early in the morning like it's deer season. They get in their car and they drive up the highway six, seven, eight miles and it's still dusk when they get to our borders. And they'll go up to, you know, literally, like, to up there to, you know, Hills Armstead, up in wherever it is, Crashbury. They'll like, go up to Lawson's and Warren or Waterbury. Or they'll, 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 they'll camp out up here at Hetty Topper Land. Or, I don't know with all the names, but they, they, they wait. They wait like a buxom come to the woods. And then the light comes up and the dawn, and someone shows up and they open the door. And they're all lined up out there. They're lined up. And all they can hope is that, you know, one of those six packs, and maybe they'll get a whole case is gonna somehow get in a trunk of their car. And they'll get to drive it home to make their miserable lives happier because they don't live in Vermont. I mean this stuff's really happening. We got a bright future. We gotta remember to keep our sense of humor and our sense of where we are. We're doing okay, team. We've got a brighter future than all of the other states because we listen to each other. We work together. When elections are over, and thank God they are, we roll up our sleeves and put the partnership aside, and we go to work, and we do tough things to make the quality of life with innovators that are second to anyone, I say. Second to nobody in the world. Food, beer, <coughs> business, technology. I could keep going, but we're doing okay. I well, appreciate your optimism and enthusiasm. Thank you for that. I mean, well, I'll just share that too. Now, in your in your last question, you mentioned uh, uh, education a couple of times, and uh, you know everybody's talking about property tax reform. And specifically, do, how, how do you think we should address the rising cost of education? And do you think that education funding should be shifted to the income tax? No. 
Let me tell you, uh, I, I believe that anyone who thinks that the answer to our education problems is to find a different pocket to pick from Vermonters has really missed a big part of the conversation. We've got a school spending problem, full stop. And we gotta fix it, full stop. So what I'm gonna do tomorrow is come out with a number of proposals that I think would help. There will be someone here that doesn't like all of them and someone here that doesn't like some of them. Uh, but listen, this is where we are. This is just the stark reality. Our student count has dropped from 112,000 students to 78,000. It's gonna to continue to drop going forward. If you think your property taxes are high now, depending upon where you live, but if you live in a small rural community that's losing students, let me be the first to tell you the bad news. You're getting your property tax right now for a bargain basement sale if you don't change, if we don't change the way we do things going forward. Because in five years, they'll be much, much worse. And in 10 years, they'll be much, much worse than that. Why? Because we have a 4.7 to one staff student teacher ratio with 30,000 fewer students and dropping. And we have pretty much not changed a thing, a thing. So then we have local control. I can tell you something about local control in my view. Local control has come to mean for many school board members and communities across Vermont, I don't get to control what I say yes to, I get to control what I say no to. It's really true. If you're in a small community, don't forget, 20% of our elementary schools in Vermont have two to six kids in a classroom. If you're in one of those communities, you're deciding in order to meet the demands of taxpayers who are sick and tired of bill to cut French or Spanish or tech classes or sports or language. I mean, God knows what. Those are your choices. So I firmly believe that we have to develop an environment about this conversation where we're going to say, there's no such thing as a bad idea. I'm going to listen to every idea. I will vet every idea and I will implement many of them. We've got to change. Now, my own belief is if you really want to see a mess, ask Montpelier to adopt a central control model where we pass some governance system where one size fits all. Like that would be uglier than what we have now and it's hard to believe. I say that because every community has different needs and unique solutions. In other words, what might be right for Putney and Dummerston will be absolutely dead wrong for Rochester parked up in a mountain between two rocks that you can't get to from here. So all I'm saying is, I'm gonna come up with a bunch of ideas. I'm asking you to come up with a bunch of ideas. If we cannot change the way we deliver education significantly, we're gonna do a huge disservice to you because you're not gonna have employees that are trained to do the work you got. We're gonna do the biggest disservice to our kids because forget the money for a minute. If you're in one of those small rural schools where student count is dropping and you only got four or five kids in your classroom, that's as bad for the quality of education that you're getting, and this is the data, as it would be to be in a class of one to 40. That's just the truth. So your kids are taking a hit and your pocketbook's taking a hit. This is not sustainable. And it's gonna require all of us, I say, in the most aggressive partnership with Montpelier and local communities to come up with the incentives and the triggers to change it. So it's not gonna be easy. Thank you, Bill. Kendall, I just was surprised. I don't know if we have time, but- We don't, unfortunately oh. we're running a little over, so Sorry. Governor- Well, cheer, this is a cheery note to close on. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any last remarks, but you're also having a question. Hey, my only last remark is, listen, uh, we need you. We need you now more than ever. We need to unify as a state 
and put all the party stuff aside. Let's hope we can do that till at least the May of a year from May when the legislature adjourns. And we got to roll up our sleeves and get and seize the opportunities that would help us solve the income growth and opportunity challenges that we're not seizing right now. And I'm just really optimistic we can do it together, but it really is gonna take a spirit of tolerance, of willingness to listen to the other side, and of a willingness to consider ideas that you've always disliked. Because I can tell you, the one thing we don't have for any of these challenges, whether it's healthcare costs that are holding back incomes, whether it's property taxes and school spending and quality that's holding back both opportunity and prosperity, whether it's balancing a budget that's spending more money than we wish, but all for good causes, this isn't gonna be easy sledding. So I'm asking for your help, your participation, your active engagement. One thing I know about Vermont, when we put our heads together and work together, we figure it out better than most. So let's do that together. Thanks so much for all you're doing.